Okay, well, um, good evening and welcome to the um, the twelfth episode in the Rucksack Club uh, slideshows, uh, lockdown slideshows, um, and it's actually the twelfth episode also in the Alpine Club lockdown slideshows. So, if you uh, magic your way back to the seventh of April, um, many of us were here on a Zoom call somewhere, um, and uh, I actually presented the first Rucksack uh, slideshow. Unbeknownst to us at the time, uh, only a, a few uh, mistyping of a Zoom address away, at exactly the same time, on exactly the same evening, uh, the Alpine Club was starting their virtual slideshows. Um, Twelve slideshows later each, we finally pulled our um, efforts together uh, and we assembled an absolute crack squad of elite mountaineers and alpinists to uh, ascend the six great uh, north faces of the Alps. Uh, we're taking uh, a couple of weeks to do that, but just an hour at a time. So um, a couple of hours to six more faces isn't bad. And it's undoubtedly the strongest team that's uh, set foot from these shores, uh, perhaps since 53, he says, ironically. Um, so uh, we've got three shows this evening, um, the, the trilogy, if you like. We'll be picking up with, uh, first of all, the Grand Jurassic, um with Nick Wallace and Martin Cooper. Uh, then we're going to have a trip up the Eiger uh, with Seth Rhodes and uh, Bill Deakin. Uh, and finally, we've got Andy Kirkpatrick taking us up uh, the Matterhorn. Uh, I'm going to hand over to the guys in a moment. Um, but just as added a bit of extra um, mood setting, uh, Leah Dickinson has kindly chipped in with some time lapse videos. So I'm just going to very briefly share you. The. Uh, view of the Grand Jurassic. Hopefully you're seeing the Grand Jurassic. There you go. So handing over now to um, Nick and Martin, to whose safe hands we will now navigate the uh, the Grand Jurassic and the Walker Spur. Nick, I'm muted. Hopefully. Okay. Um, Coops, are you there and ready to go, Coops? There we go. Yep, yep. I'm uh, I'm unmuted, muted, and ready to go. So, uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, well, the Grand Jurassic, the Walker Spur. Um, well, I suppose like all of the best alpine routes it um, shares three essential features uh, firstly i mean it's a stunning and obvious line uh, secondly that line leads straight to the summit top of a big mountain and thirdly and perhaps most importantly it's clearly visible from a railway station so therefore lots of um, uh, you know lots of passers-by can see it I was just going to show a quick overview of the route. So I don't know whether Nick, you're allowed, to, whether you're able to uh, point with a cursor or anything, but it, it starts at the toe of the buttress there and then skirts up the snow to just about here, breaks through onto a bit of more solid ground, up through a collection of towers and, and features, and then um, nice solid rock, all of this, and we eventually bivvied our first night somewhere around here. And then, as you'll say, see the character of the route sort of changed a bit, and we sort of forged on upwards to the top and over. Um, so Nick and I climbed it in late July 2006, so it's stretching the memories to remember what just went on. Um, I hadn't realised at the time just how lucky we were really to get it in good condition because, you know, being a north face and being predominantly a rock route, you want it to be dry. Um, but it's only a few weeks of the year that there's enough sun on enough of it to get rid of the snow. Um, and so when it does come into condition, you're, you're unlikely to be by yourself. So we can head on to the next slide, please, Nick. Uh, yeah, so when we got to the Le Show Hut, and this is the view from the Le Show Hut, I mean, it's a stunning position. 
there were three or four uh, parties of Italians were there already. So we got up at death o'clock to be in pole position and headed off and all went well, but we had a bit of a hot sprint up the, up the glacier. And in, in my excitement crossing the Bergschrund, I forgot to put my gloves on, which wasn't a good idea, seeing as we were going up bullet hard ice just to the right of the bottom of the spur there. And my axe was just one, I just had one little sort of toffee hammer axe, as my friend John Morgan would call it, a light alloy axe. So um, I think my hands were red raw by the time I you know, got to the rock itself. I think uh, I left a trail for Nick to follow. He just followed the blood. Um, and anyway, that got us off that bit, thank God, and onto the rock itself. And it starts off sort of fairly easy angled. And um, it's a bit indistinct to start with. And we, we went too far left, which meant that the pesky Italians outflanked us and got ahead of us. Um, and then onto the next slide, Nick. First real obstacle you come across is the Rebefat crack at about 6A that then blends, you step sideways into the Piera Land crack at 6A plus. And Nick thought I was being very gallant in offering to lead this pitch, but it was really just so I didn't have to carry the rucksacks. And I think Nick probably had to carry both rucksacks on this. So he was the one doing the real tour de force on this. Um, and so, I mean, most of the rock's very good. Uh, it really is. And of course it's in a stunning, stunning position. And here's Nick climbing in sort of camouflaged stealth mode. You can only see a, a little helmet, the rest of them in disguise to try and catch up with the uh, pesky Italians who had, who had got on ahead of us. Um, so you head up this and then the most obvious feature of Possibly the whole route is this 75 metre Deirdre, mm -hmm. which um, gives two or three pitches of brilliant HVS climbing, really well protected, really solid. Um, above that, the roof uh, route gets a little bit uh, less obvious, a uh, bit more, but the rock's, the rock's really good. Uh, there's all sorts of black slabs and grey towers and grey slabs and red towers and lord knows i mean lord knows what they all were the, the easy thing to do is just to follow the italians which is what we did and here here they are there was a there was a bunch of them and there were a cheery bunch and um sort of scaling the peak to great cries of recuperamo which is i think italian for take in so we were still soon saying exactly the same which they thought was hilarious but um I mean, it's here we were in a big north face and it's crowded and not the place to go if you're socially distancing, I don't think. Um, anyway, headed off after the Italians. The, as we headed up, the rock the, gets, um, you know, the day became a bit more uh, sort of dramatic and you get fantastic views through the cloud over to the, um, you know, billowing clouds up from below and over to the side, you see the cross spur. And it was then we thought, right, we're, we're about ready to done for the day. So looking for somewhere to bivy and over to Nick. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, so yeah, that was a, a pretty long day. We're pretty tired, but we were treated to this pretty spectacular sunset and um, over the Chamonix Aigui that you can see uh, and, the, and the distance there. Um, and uh, for some reason, I, I really can't explain why I decided not to take a sleeping bag. Um, so pretty enviously looking at Martin here as he unpacked his bag, which included a sleeping bag for him. So um, I had a duvet and a, and a kind of bivy bag that I also discovered was full of loads of mesh panels. Um, so it was a pretty chilly night for me. I think um, Martin had a marginally better night. Um, not the best of bivvies, but kind of, you know, good enough. And um, the morning kind of came all too slowly, really, but we were treated to this amazing sunset and it's a you know, pretty amazing place to be spending the night um so yeah next morning um woke up and kind of this is what we woke up to which was sort of not ideal really um so pretty gray skies from the off which was a bit worrying um and a, and a very icy chimney full of lots of in situ italians um and this all took a while i mean it was pretty pretty difficult climbing pretty slow going every stance had you know at least two people on it so there was a lot of waiting around um and you know eventually we slowly got going and um one of the italian pairs which is a very strong father and son team who'd been you know they're clearly very good rock climbers 
Um, and I think the, the father was a very good mountaineer. The son was definitely less interested once it got a bit snowy, as you can see here. So they just called for the chopper on their mobile phone, up down a few pitches and called the chopper in. It's utterly spectacular watching this chopper come in below us and pluck these guys off the face. Yeah, and just amazing. Um, so I think that's them there on the on the flatter bit of the spur below. Um, and, you know, I can't say I blame them, really. It's it's kind of pretty hostile up here. It's, it's definitely not a rock climb. Um, very mixed um, and, you know, pretty, pretty tenuous, I would say. Um, so anyway, on we went. This is kind of into the red red chimneys. So we're so we're well up, up near the top of the route now. Um, but proper mixed climbing. And like like Martin said, we'd we'd taken really lightweight ski touring style kind of aluminium axes, one each, you know, definitely not ideal. And I think if I did it again, I'd take a proper axe. Um, I think Coops had some vaguely sensible crampons. I had bendy aluminium crampons as well. You had and, the uh, sensible axe and the silly crampons, and I, I had vice versa. Oh, okay. And you know, you're standing up on these little edges and you're watching the front points bending and oh just thinking about it now i'm you know, kind of sort of wonder what were we thinking but anyway we got away with it so it's kind of all right but um yeah i think i'd take proper gear if i did it again um so anyway yeah traverse out rightwards under the red tower and it's kind of pretty pretty difficult climbing there and you know really icy um you know so some of the hardest climbing there and while we were in that section there was kind of a big electric storm kicked off as well so rumbles of thunder and lightning and, and at one point, I remember quickly placing a few bits of gear, then lowering back down to try and get a bit a bit lower off the ridge. Um, fortunately, you know, it was it was quite short lived and it passed quickly, but could have been pretty serious. We, we were totally committed at this point. Um, so luckily that that passed and we were able to carry on. And this is right near the top of the route where the where the walk where sorry, where the Colton Mac comes in from the right and kind of the last pitch. Last pitch to the cornice, really. That's me kind of just going through the cornice. And um, you can see it's definitely not um, rock boots and chalk bag conditions. Um, kind of topped out into a total pea super. Um, fortunately, the thunder and lightning had kind of, you know, had gone away. So that was a bit of a relief. Um, and we started the really long descent into, you know, down to the Boccoletti hut on the Italian side, which is, you know, it's really long. You know, there's probably a fair number of you have done it or know it pretty involved um it took all the rest of that day to um to get down to the boccoletti um and this was the next morning outside the hut um taken by some german guys who were in the hut hink um and yeah pretty tired um but pretty pretty chuffed to you know to get get up the route and everything had gone kind of okay um so that was all good um martin had very sore hands as he mentioned um there, there literally was a very impressive trail of blood above the Bergshund. Um, so um, yeah, but other than that, it, all, it had all gone <clears> pretty well. Um, and I'd say in terms of the route, you know, a kind of really long, really sustained um, and kind of, you know, a fitting tribute to its creator, I think, Cassin. And um, we we got stuck up in to, into a couple of beers down in the, when we reached the valley. And I think, you know, if, um, if Carlsberg made Alpine routes, I think this would be this would be one of them, and uh, it's certainly one of the uh, one of the finest that we've both enjoyed. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is silent applause. We'll have some proper applause later on for everybody uh, when we've uh, sorted the tech out. But uh, brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Martin. That was uh, really exciting. And uh, those of you, uh, hopefully you're storing your questions as you go, so we'll um, be able to pick up those uh, at the end. Okay, so next up we've got um, the Eiger, and again, just to set the scene, I'm going to just share you another Leo Dickinson um, time-lapse uh, presentation. This one's a bit more moody. Here goes. I don't know if Bill and Seth find that um, recognisable in terms of the general level of um, moodiness going on there. Yeah. Yeah. I won't play the whole minute because actually you don't get to see them all face at all, really, to speak of. <laughs> you get the <laughs> idea. Okay, in which case I'll hand over to uh, 
Right, Tony, fire up your own projector and uh, off we go. Yeah. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Am I on, Dom? Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. You can hear me? Good, Joe. Sure. Right, Joe. Sure. Can you hear me? Mother? Can you hear me, mother? <laughs> right, this uh, is a picture of the Iga. Uh, very simply, you walk across, we vivid in this area I, here somewhere. I can't see a picture. You can't see the picture? No. No, no, no picture. Oh, come on. Bloody hell. Share your screen. Shut up, you. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Good. Good. Well, our, our ascent started around here. You'll see where we vivid. We found us a nice safe cave. Um, it goes up here past the first ice field. No, can't see it. Can't see what? I thought can't I was see doing the next one. Can't, can't see what? The next one. Can you not see the eye, the picture? I can see the first picture. I can't see the next picture. The picture of the Iga. Uh, yeah, well, that north face of the Iga there. Yeah, the north face of the Iga. Well, I'm talking yeah. over it now. If you if you can bear with me, William. I'll zip up. <laughs> It shows you the... All right, then. Next picture, Dave. Thank you. There we are. <coughs> and we bivied down here to begin with. We found a safe bivy. Uh, no, we didn't. We climbed... No, we bivied. We bivied just below the stock and lock. Now, do you so... want to do this? Or shall I do it? Or you no, do no, it? you do it. <laughs> we bivied here to begin with. Down in a cave. And the voice of... Up to what we thought might be the rope flu, but wasn't there. Uh, to the second ice field, and then we bivied here at a very opportune spot called Death Bivy, and then we carried on. And I'll describe the top part when we come to it. There's a bit of a tale there. Well, mm. this story really starts in 1963. When I was 17 and Bill was about 16 or 15, Bonnington, oh, younger than that. <laughs> Bonnington and Clough, he always maintains he's a lot younger than me. He's not. But he doesn't even look it. Uh, Bonnington and Clough climbed it in 63 and they gave, uh, 62. They gave a slideshow. 62, says. Thank you, William. All right. They gave a slideshow in Manchester at the Free Trade Hall, mm. which impressed most of us no end and we thought wait it was just a dream to us we never thought we were up to that kind of stuff <laughs> bonnington was a kind of god and so were his contemporaries and we were just run-of-the-mill climbers uh come 1992 and we're now mid 40s and we're off to the alps as usual and suddenly and i have to say it was bill who said it let's do the argo i said okay so after a saturday night at main road Manchester, watching the Rolling Stones live. We wandered over to Switzerland fairly quickly. Just camped there. The next day, by the Tuesday, we were going up to Kleine Scheidegg. Uh, it was a good forecast, and we walked in that afternoon to Bivy, low down, as I have mentioned, uh, below the first pillar. Uh, the attraction, of course, of the Eiger is the approach. It's a doddle. You catch a train up and you walk across. It's brilliant. It has some disadvantages, but that's one advantage. Uh, so there we are, train up to climb the shard egg, walk across a bivy. Let's have a look, Dave. Now, this is a bit, uh, not a very good picture. These are very old slides. This is in 1992, so these are slides. This is the Can I just correct you before you go on? It's 1990. It's 1992. And <laughs> <laughs> Go on, then. And it's built in the little cave that we found. Perfectly safe. Carry on. Dave. And Bill worked at the time for British Fighter. And the, 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 the small factory he ran for British Fighter produced a, a pillow called the Iger Pillow. And there he is, hoping to get in on his PR 
uh, with the, in with his PR people with a picture of the Iger. Mm. Yeah, the Iger to the sales, I've got to say. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to put up with this kind of activity all the time. I, of course, carry on, Dave, was busy wandering over, away from the... That's the, that's the cave we vivid in. And I wandered over to this ice over here. So we carried on up now and we're heading towards a difficult crack. Dave? There we are. We're roped up now. <coughs> we're in uh, all the correct gear for the 1990s. Notice the uh, the gators. I Etc. thought you were going for the reconstruction of the first ascent, says actually. <laughs> Thank you, William. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's fairly easy or reasonable climbing. No crampons needed. The weather's looking good. And we're headed towards a difficult crack. Here we are, Dave. And this is Bill. Fairly early in the morning. It's chilly. He's got big boots on and he's got a grade five pitch. And that was no accident, by the way. I had worked it out about 100 metres before that, exactly where I would have to be lay, so that the final belay I took was below this crack. And it was Bill's lead. Not an accident. But he, he ploughed on up very competently. And it's quite good climbing. You know, it's quite pleasant climbing. No stonefall at the moment. Nothing like that. Right, Dave. And then you start to plod across the first ice field towards... No, you don't. No, you don't. Stop bloody contradicting me, will you? <laughs> well, you know, we're near the first ice field. Right, we're going across this ice towards a hint of story, sir. Next one, Dave. Here we are, where the yellow arrow is. So we're at this point now. Right, Dave. And this is... A view from the ice, you can see it's a uh, very attractive ice. It's covered in bits of uh, stone. It's rock hard, of course, so it's, it's okay for climbing up. Uh, and I think that's one of us on the Hinterstoyser. That's you at the end. Me at the end there. Right. Carry on. Yeah. Only because you got the fixed ropes. <laughs> yeah, we've done the fixed ropes on the Hinterstoyser, uh, which I pulled on merrily. We did look up and hope we would see this um, this ice holes feature, but it wasn't there. It's not. It's not there. It's not been there for a long time now, apparently. And it's just wet slabs up to the second ice field. And here we are, ploughing away with all the latest gear, as you can see, looking happy as Larry there. Uh, you can see there's no glass here below us. That's the fields below. So it's a uh, it's almost a roadside crag, this room. <coughs> Carry on, Dave. Beyond that, we're now on the flat iron area, and we're heading up to just below that cliff there, where we were looking at this time for a, a bivy site. And I remember at this, we're not, not a true with Stonefall, and Bill took his sack off at one point, just here. And the, the moment he took it off, a stone hit him right in the middle of the back, so he put it, put it back on fairly quickly. But that was really the only serious tool we had with Stonefall. I think we were just lucky. It was good so weather conditions, up. though, wasn't it? Sorry, Bill? It was good weather conditions. We it had. was good weather, yeah. Yeah, I think we got lucky with the weather. Um, next one, Dave. Yeah. Uh, we're now gone up the second ice field, and at the point of the arrow, underneath the arrow is the other words, Death bivouac. We arrived at this suitable, well, I thought it was a suitable bivouac site, a bit wet, but sheltered from rockfall. Uh, and there aren't that many big suitable ledges that you can have a good lie down on. And this looked like, you know, we could just lie down on it. We had to move along a bit. And it was at this point that Bill actually told me where we were. You know where we are, don't you? Death bivouac. So <laughs> it was quite eerie, really. Anyway, the night. You're right, Dave. Fairly decent bivouac. Uh, there's me drinking the tea that Bill's kindly made. The weather's still looking good. And from this site, you can actually look across the third ice field, go on, Dave, uh, to the ramp. And this is next morning, Bill crossing that third ice field 
he's got his crampons on now. And we're, from here on, we wore, I think we wore crampons all the way to the summit. Yeah, I think we did. Because we'd got, it had start to become, you know, the rock was getting icy in places. So you wore crampons all the time, I think, from now on. Carry on, Dave. Uh, he's that's me coming towards him across that ice field. You descend slightly to the ramp. Right, Dave. You climb the ramp. I thought we had a picture of the ramp, but we don't. Now, the ramp's got some three and four on it. It's about, I don't know, eight, seven or eight pictures. Good long pictures. And you have to climb with your axes handy. This is some ice at the top of a pitch. Bill's just coming up here. And it was here, he, he reminded me, this is called the tier, apparently, this piece of ice. And it's where the first solo attempt failed. The chap, poor chap, I've forgotten his name, but this is where he fell from on his foot on the first <laughs> solo attempt. Uh, it was but, Adolf Mayer, actually. Adolf Mayer, yes. Yeah. yeah These photos are imprinted on my memory. Yes, when, you, when you're on, on this route, you're permanently referring back to the white spider, aren't you? you <laughs> You know, it's uh, there's loads of little stories about all, all, all the way up, really. So uh, most of them aren't happy stories, are they? No, they're not happy stories. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, again, the weather's holding for us. Um, we're going okay. I found this bit's quite trying actually because you've climbed up rock, you've got your axes in your holster, and suddenly you're confronted by this piece of ice. Uh, this for me was one of the testing pieces on, on the route um, but we carried on up the ramp carry on Dave um, you come to some ice like this at the top of the ramp and then you, you've got to move rightwards and we're looking here to climb up towards the Traverse of the Gods this is the brittle ledges the what sorry the brittle Ledges. It's the brittle ledges, yeah, that lead up to the Traverse of the Gods. That's a picture of me coming across to Bill. It's not quite that dramatic. It does look dramatic there, doesn't it? Um, the brittle ledges do provide a bit more testing climbing. This is where yeah, we actually we, we used uh, nuts and stuff for protection. It, uh, I'd say it was four or five in places. And you get onto... Dave, the, the Traverse of the Gods. Now, at the start of the Traverse of the Gods, we both noticed a bloody great, lovely, flat ledge, one that you could lie down on. And there were, we hadn't seen any so far, and we knew there weren't many higher up. And I, kept, I looked at this ledge, and it looked really attractive. Turned out nice again, though, was not it? <laughs> yeah. And uh, we're doing about this ledge from uh, Dave Barton. We saw him on the, on the ferry. Uh, Dave Barton's one of the, the Burnley climbers, friend of uh, Alan Firth. Alan mentioned him a couple of, couple of weeks ago. And David spent two nights on this ledge in bad weather and he described it to us. He said it's a really good bivy site. But we passed it. And here we are. The Traverse of the Gods is, there's no, nothing difficult on it. It's just, it's very airy. I have to say it's very airy. And we're going towards in the distance there, you can see the white spider. We're here. There's the Traverse of the Gods, there's a spider. Right, Dave. Just about to get onto the spider. Carry on, Dave. Ah, now then, let's, let's, let's go back. We can. Right, so we went up the spider. No, he didn't go about, up it. We went about two pictures up it, three pictures. <laughs> and... We couldn't find, because it, it, the weather clouded in then. It had been clear as a bell. Suddenly, it's half five in the afternoon, six o'clock, and it all comes in. And here we are at the top of the white spider, looking up at the exit cracks, or where, where they should be. Now, it's notoriously difficult to find the right one. And people do struggle a bit. And we were definitely, I had no idea, couldn't spot which one it was. And my thinking went like this. If we carry on up here now at six o'clock, we ain't going to get to the top by nine or half nine or wherever it was when it went dark. Climbing in the dark on ice rock with crampons, no, I don't fancy that. We knew there was no decent bivy site, so we were looking at a night in, uh, as described many times in the White Spider, 
hanging on something, just sitting in your harness. And that definitely didn't appeal to me. My back was killing me. And I, I kept thinking about this lovely flat ledge. So I said to Bill, I think, and I didn't tell him why, it was because I wanted to lie down. <laughs> uh, we should go back to that ledge. And he shrugged yeah. and said, okay, okay, yeah. So we yeah, we're right back. I thought, Anthony, I thought at that point in time, we could have gone for it. Yes, and I think you'd have been wrong. I think we'd have... Uh, <laughs> what? Me? Wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're right back down the spider and back along the Traverse of the Gods. And yeah. then we landed at this beautiful ledge. Now, on this ledge, on the way past, we'd noticed, and Bill had to stop me putting it in my sack, a lovely brand new rope that had been abandoned there, coiled. I did contemplate taking it with us. It was uh, obviously a few quid's worth. Yeah, but, uh, put, it, put just, it in my bag. And also, yeah. <laughs> some odd things. We found something that looked like two half ping pong balls, didn't we? Yeah. In fact, Billy's wearing them. <laughs> we couldn't work out what they were. But there he is. He's on this beautiful ledge wearing them. <clears throat> so at this point, that the weather did take a turn for the worse. It, well, in the, a big storm started to erupt behind the Iger, at the back of the Iger. The, the sky went dark. There were fireworks. At about 11 o'clock at night, the skies lit up, and obviously storms wandering around. And at this point, Bill, who, who, who had been a, he'd been a manager all his life, and in best managerial speak, as they do when they shift the blame, he said... I hope you're happy with your mountaineering decision. As if it was entirely my fault. <laughs> but I just shrugged and <laughs> I recognised his, uh, his management speak that I was familiar with. Uh, we had a good night there, I have to say. Uh, Can I just stop you there again? Because yeah. you had a good night there <laughs> because oh. there was only room for you to lie down. <laughs> Well, I thought it was only right and proper because I had the backache. Yeah, true sure enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a good night's kit. Well, one of us did. <laughs> and we ate. Carry and on. It was, uh, yeah, it was very pleasant. It was it was okay there. And it was it was protected from any stormfall. Which is, is a constant worry on that Carry field. on. Carry on. Carry on, Dave. There we are. There's me looking Dave. very happy. Carry on, Dave. And here's Bill coming up the white spider. Uh, it's, it's quite a steep bit of ice, really. And of course, it's the funnel for all the stuff that comes down from the summit. But we, I think we were lucky. Look at that weather now. This is next morning. Hey, did I make the right decision? Of course I did. The weather's lovely now, and we're set for the summit. And it all went well, really. Carry on, Dave. <laughs> My partner, this is my son-in-law here, who's, who's a bit of an IT whiz, so he's doing this. Uh, really? Here we are. We found the exit cracks. And by the way, this is where we both felt a bit of admiration for Andel Heckmar, who did all the leading on the original ascent. Because I have to say, when, it, when we were just considering it, I said, well, it's only 1938, Billy. It can't be that bloody hard. Uh, Heckmar was a pretty good climber. I mean, some of this stuff, especially on these exit cracks, he was no mug. And of course, you're on iced up rock a lot now. You're in your crampons. So mm -hmm. it does concentrate your mind. But we were, <laughs> we were okay. Here we are. Oh, look at that sunshine on the summit there. Mm. We're in front of us. And this is, this is where I, I actually got summit fever and suggested we unrope somewhere up here. But Bill wisely said, don't be daft. And we didn't, fortunately. Well, we went up the, uh, the final, the summit ice field. And I'm glad he said don't unroll because I found that I broke my front points when I was uh, scrabbling away on ice. <laughs> no front points or one of the feet. But we're on the summit. The weather's changing a bit. We had some snow on the way down, but we didn't care because we'd finished. And the route, the way down's quite, it's quite straightforward, really. We took our time, uh, dealt with it. It was snow cover, but it didn't really matter. Uh, yeah, so 
a good ascent for us. We enjoyed it. And uh, the other thing was, Sess, we didn't see another person. That's right. Ah, uh, yes, yes. We and that worried me at one point. I thought, do they well, know something we don't? At one point, it worried me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're on this big face, and nobody else is on it. You think, what? Do they know something we don't? Because about three days later, we went to Chamonix, and we went to do Martin and Nick. We went to do the um, Walker Spur. Walker. We bivied on the on the, the murder glass, and we got on the approach slopes. And we could see 18 people sat beneath the Rebufa crack. So we'd come off this big hill, no one on it. 18 people sat beneath the Rebufa crack. And we decided, hmm, we gave up then. We, we, we went back down, along with quite a few other people who were waiting for another day. It hasn't happened yet, of course. <laughs> OK, that's it. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay, and um, on to the um, the third of our holy trilogy. Uh, we have a very quick uh, look at the uh, the Dickinson picture mood setting again. So uh, let's have a go with that. It's a much friendlier face of the uh, Matterhorn with the sun coming up onto it. Absolutely magnificent. OK, over to um, Andy uh, to take us through uh, a trip up the Matterhorn. All right. <laughs> so hopefully you can all, um, can all hear me. Uh, this is going to be a sort of a strange abstract kind of a slideshow for because uh um i only started doing this about two hours ago so uh so it's a, we're going to go on like a little bit of a journey like because an adventure is uh, a, a journey with an uncertain amount of outcome so this is uh we're going to begin come here so this is me um where i was been living recently i was living out in the in the middle east uh, which is a uh, which is a very good preparation for where we are now because it's basically lots of people wearing masks and uh, all this kind of stuff. And um, uh, anybody wants any an interesting kind of place to go climbing? Uh, Saudi Arabia, highly highly recommend it. So we're gonna we're gonna begin here at like plus fifty degrees and then bring the temperature down. So uh, yeah, so Saudi Arabia, uh, very easy to get visas there now. Well, it was maybe not anymore. So. Uh, lots of interesting uh, mountains, uh, not not that hot. Uh, this is a, a slab which is probably about a thousand meters high. There's some tiny little houses like halfway up on one side. Um, so if you go there in the middle of the winter, it's probably only going to be like you know 40 degrees. It's going to be you know pretty pretty chilly. You probably you have to haul a lot of water up there as you're climbing up there. So um, so I was living out in the Middle East and. Uh, uh, I was going, we were going home from Oman and uh, uh, the COVID thing happened and we basically ended up uh, getting deported. So we were, uh, we, we ended up uh, in Ireland and um, uh, we lost all our stuff, all our, all our possessions and all our bags with all our climbing gear got lost as well. And so about four months later, we, we went to the airport in Dublin to try and find if they could find our bags with our climbing gear and stuff. And uh, like everything was kind of crazy. And I was, while, while trying to find these bags, uh, the phone rang and it was Victor Saunders. And Victor was like, hey, Andy, they're doing this slideshow about the North Face. Do you want to talk about the North Face of the Matterhorn? And I was like, uh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, just send me a send me a link or something. So, so, so that's how I've ended up here talking about the... Uh, the North Face of the Matterhorn, which uh, when we get to it, it might be a bit of an anticlimax, but we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll find out whether one, one way or the other. So, um, so I just need to point out I have actually climbed some some North Faces. Uh, I've never climbed the North Face of the Eiger, and uh, but I have I've climbed some other sort of classic sort of North Faces. This is the North Face of the of the Drew, um, which is a which is a good one if you're into sort of Scottish kind of climbing. This is the Le 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 Sieur, Le Sieur route, and um, 
But the, the the story that he that Victor wanted me to talk about was uh, in 2014. So in 2014, I'd been out in Antarctica, sort of climbing, and this is this is Ulvatana, which is uh, Leah Holding did another route on the other side of here, which was a lot easier. I think they call it like the I think people will ski down it now and stuff, and uh, there's like a, a mountain bike track and stuff up, up that side. So this is this is the this is the proper this is the proper side. Um, and this here is a woman, Norwegian woman, who's climbing. So yeah, I'm sort of doing something for the sex, you know, sex stuff. So um, this this uh, Norwegian woman had never wasn't a climber; she was a base jumper. This is her like climbing up some terrible, uh, terrible, grotty kind of horrible rock. Like this, this rock is horrendous. Anyway, so I came back from I came back from this trip in Antarctica. Now, a really good advice for people for any young alpinist here is you should never. If you ever come back off an expedition, you should never split up with your, never break up a relationship and until you get taken like two weeks, stay back for two weeks. Often people, they, they, they go away, have like an amazing trip in the mountains or whatever, and they come back and then they start like changing their lives and giving up their jobs and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, so that, that's kind of what I did. I came back and uh, my, my life ended up being a, a, a complete shambles after this trip to Antarctica. But I was in I was in Yosemite. Uh, like often, like climbing is the only thing you can do, which tends to make any sense. You know, you can just go climbing with your climbing partners, and that you know everything's kind of the same when you're climbing. But I was in Yosemite, and I had I just had like one week in Yosemite, and I was really wanting to make the most of it. So I kind of arrived uh, in the evening, and I slept in the woods, and then the next day. I tried to climb the uh, leaning tower. Uh, I tried to solo leaning tower in a day, and I got um, sort of two thirds of the way up it, and then the sun the sun came out, and it was, it was really really hot. So I uh, I abseiled down, and then uh, I went to camp four, and I met these two guys, uh, Stefan and uh, Cherry, who were I'd seen them on the DMM website that they were going to Yosemite, and they looked really really keen. So I just kind of bumped into them, and I was like, "Do you want to go and climb?" the uh, leading tower tomorrow like in a day so i ne never met them before but they were like super super keen so we so we uh went and slept at the bottom that night and then the next day we like uh climbed up there which was kind of cool with these like new you know like you know people you, it's, it's kind of cool climb for people you don't know so we we came down we had a pizza went back to camp four and then i bumped into uh, callum musket who was uh, at the time i think he just climbed like indian face and he was like he had, he had all this kind of all this kind of super super so much energy and he was like oh we have to go and climb we have to go and climb el cap in a day tomorrow and i was like but i have to go i've got you know i've got to i've got to drive home like the day after tomorrow i'm like i'm quite tired he's like no no you've got to we've got to do it so he had like so much energy and he's like super strong climber so we decided to um go and do that so we went we went up maybe that evening again like i don't think we to bed yet so we went up that evening and we slept at the bottom and the next day we did a, a climb lurking fear which is um is 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 probably one of the easiest routes to do on el cap so we got to the top so this is this is a good photograph that demonstrates how knackered i was and uh, and i remember that my head torch was my i i, I think i had two head torches uh, which is good if you're in speed climbing, you have two head touches, but both of them were, were almost dead. And I literally only just got down a fell cap in the dark with this head touch. I had to hold it in my hand, like just about, you know, like a foot off the ground to see where I was going. And Callum just like left me there. And I was like, like, I'm literally going to have to sleep, bivvy, bivvy out, like, you know, because I can't see where to get down. But anyway, managed to get back, managed, managed to get back down again. So um, a few months later, I was at the the Kendall Film Festival and Jeff Lowe was there. This is not a very good photograph. Uh, Jeff Lowe was there and Jeff Lowe uh, won. He got like a prize for his film, uh, Metanoa. So if no one, if, I don't know if anybody's seen Metanoa, but it's a great film. And it kind of describes the first ascent of Jeff Lowe's sort of solo route up the up the Eiger. And at that, at that time, no one had ever, no one had repeated this route. And, uh, um, uh, one of the Hoobers and uh, Stefan Seagreese thingy like repeated it, uh, was it last year? But anyway, it was, a, it was a big kind of deal. And at the same the same festival, Callum was there. Now Callum was, you know, like, I don't know what, I don't know what he's doing now. I think he's probably just become a guide. So it's like the end of his climbing kind of career. 
but he he was you know he had all this energy and he was like Ur. and I was like why don't we go and do why would we try and go and do the metanoa on the Eiger and I thought it'd be kind of cool because he could probably lead like all of it and I think there's one pitch was like A4 and I could like do the aid aid climbing kind of bit and he could just do the rest of it he had way too much energy so we uh we made these kind of plans to go out um to the Eiger so the Eiger uh like I think I've actually spent about a month of my life on the north face of the Eiger without without getting up it, which is which is kind of fairly impressive. Like most people seem to try and climb the Eiger and they you know they they, they try it they, you know they, they spend like a day on it, half a day, and then they come back down and they they try again, they come back down, and then they do it at the third time or they don't or they don't do it again. So I seem to spend a lot of time um, up there um, and always been trying to climb the Harlin route. So this is this is. Paul Ramsden, uh, me and Paul Ramsden going up to try and do the Harlan route. And on this trip, we had this like 100 meter rope. And when we uncoil at the bottom, a mouse had eaten through through it. So there was actually, uh, it was like one rope, it was like a 30 meter rope and a, and a 60 meter rope. So um, so it was kind of it was kind of doomed. And I remember we, we like slept at the very base of the first sort of steep pitch of the Harlan. And... Uh, it started snowing. It started snowing about one o'clock in the morning. And it just snowed for a little bit, and then the alarm went off at like four in the morning. And I was like, I was like, I don't think we should go. I think I, I think we should. I don't think we should go. And uh, and he was like, okay. So we laid there a little bit longer. And then this huge avalanche kind of came down where we we're going to go. So it was. Uh, and Paul was like, I don't, I don't. I think I'll leave this to you. I don't want to do this kind of thing. So Paul, yeah. So it's. It's strange. So um, anyway, so I tried to solo. I tried to solo the Harlan um, twice because it seemed it, it seemed easier. Some t- some of these routes, um, these North Face kind of routes, you can see where people solo them. It's actually quite hard to find people who want to climb them. Um, just just trying to climb like regular routes is is quite hard. But if you want to climb anything that's a little bit esoteric, it's it's quite hard to to um, to get anyone who's interested and. Uh, the the Eiger is kind of interesting, and it's it's uh, it's quite it's not as steep as you think it's going to be, but it's uh, it's just really really hard to find any um, kind of B layers or whatever. So, um, so so eventually, I managed to find two people to try and climb the the Russian route on the Eiger, which is like a super direct kind of route up the Eiger, and and the only way I could get them up there was to kind of well they kind of tricked me and I tricked them. This was a Callum Musket, who is a like a phenomenally good uh, big wall climber, like a lives in the Lake District, I think. And but Callum, when we got onto the, when we started up the route, he admitted he'd never worn crampons before, which is uh, which is fairly impressive. He's probably the first person ever to go on the hike with who would never worn crampons before. And and the other guy, um, Ross, was actually uh, I'd never climbed with him. I never met him. I never climbed with Neil either. But I I never met Ross. But I had actually climbed with his twin brother, and he was like an identical twin. So I kind of thought if I've climbed with his twin brother, then he would be similar. And and he was. Anyway, so we we spent I think it was like a week on the Eiger, and it was absolutely amazing. Um, you you get to like you get to go to all these interesting kind of places. This is actually a, a snow hole we actually dug. Uh, you know, as we're climbing up there, and we could actually put a tent. We had a three-man tent. We actually put the tent up inside this snow hole, and we found this snow hole. Uh, Ross was trying to find a bee lane, just fell through this hole into this like uh, cavern, chasm, uh, uh, cavern of snow. And this is one of the. This is kind of the the kind of bee lays we had. Uh, some bee lays had sort of like two cordlets with like bared beaks and cams. And re- really, what we should have done is taken a bolt kit and just put two bolts in. It would have been a hell of a lot probably safer but um yeah so that, that that's one interesting thing when you're alpine climbing generally you know you often have fairly you can it can be kind of slightly dodgy b layers like an old peg you know your own nut or whatever but when you're hauling and there's three of you you end up having these quite complex complex b layers so uh we ended up getting up to um we're only still on the fe- on the first band of a week on this route uh i think the russian got the russians did the first ascent they were up there for a long, like a lot, a, a very long time. So we um, we got to this bit here, and what happened was Neil, Neil actually, this is kind of A five uh, kind of climbing, so super, super dodgy kind of climbing. He actually climbed past the B layer and into the next pitch, which was A five. 
<laughs> and uh, we, we, we didn't we didn't have a very good topo, so we ended up kind of bailing off because we thought it was you know. Neil said it wasn't hard; it was just impossible. So, 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 so when I was when I was talking to Callum, I was like, "Oh yeah, you know, maybe this is my chance to finally get up the eye gear with you. We'll we'll go out there and we'll, you know, it'd be you know, you could just lead everything, and I'll just take a camera, I'll take some photographs of you. It'd be good for your good for your sponsors." So, so we we went over and went over to, to Switzerland. But Callum, he was under twenty one, so the higher car. Was, was really expensive because I don't think I had, for some reason, I couldn't drive. I can't remember why. So um, I didn't have a visa card. So uh, anyway, so, so this was the worst thing. Like never go climbing with someone where you have to hire a car if they're under 21, even if they're super talented, like go off, get someone who's a little bit, you know, wait a little bit till a little bit older. So we went out there and the, the weather, was, weather was rubbish. Like we, we, we went up to, we went and parked up in um, somewhere and, uh, in the morning, the weather was rubbish on the eye again. It just looked like bare and whatever. So that, that's that's and that's one thing. If you want to if you want to climb a lot of these routes in the Alps, uh, you really have to be you really have to be living there. I think like it's amazing that Brits can actually go out and just get on the nine thirty eight route or the Walk to Spare or or any of these routes. Um, you really have to go there for like a long, long time. Uh, ideally, you live there. And then you can really, really pick when the conditions are, are really good. So it's amazing that any British people ever climb any of these routes because the chance of going going there and just getting on it, you have to be so persistent. So um, so we decided to go over to the Mount Home. So again, it was like super expensive. You had to get on these trains, the car and go over across through a mountain and all this kind of stuff. And we got and we decided what we we're going to do. We we're going to try this route, um, the like the the. the that goes up the nose of the Matterhorn, which is again, it was really perfect because it had some sort of hard aid climbing on it that I could do. And then Callum could just do all the free climbing, which was probably mainly free climbing. And it looked like it was going to be like e sort of 60 degree ice for, you know, 600 meters and then some rock climbing up to like 6A, M, M6 kind of climbing. And then a bit of aid climbing and I could do that and then he could do the rest. So it was just a, you know, if you look at sort of Patrick Gabaru and a lot of these, you know, really good climbers as they're getting older, they just basically find some really good young climber and just exploit them, you know, like a Sven Gali, like come and join my band. And the, you know, they, they do all the hard stuff. And then, you know, you always have your, it's like Rab Anderson, you know, so it was, it was always Rab Anderson with somebody else. And, right, you know, you just find, you just find the really good climbers. So uh, on the way, though, we realized we didn't have any bolt hangers. You need to have some bolt hangers for this route. And we didn't have any, so so then we decided we'd try and do the the Bonatti the Bonatti route instead. So again, because they have to exploit the fact that Callum is a really good climber, you know, and you know just do find something hard that he could do, and I could just follow along behind him. But actually, I'd actually tried to climb the Bonatti route before with um, with Paul Ramsden, who I should point out is a fourth time uh, Pile d'Or winner. So you know this is a you know again you know I think. It, Paul is one of these people. I think he's actually the same age as me, but he looks like he's about seven. You know, he's got this seventy-year-old kind of demeanor, mainly because he's from he's kind of like he's from Bradford. So, um, so yeah. So we so we'd been like two thousand and three or something. We tried to climb. The idea was to go and climb the climb the Bonatti route on the Matterhorn. So this was the kind of rack we had. We had, you know, pegs and all this kind of stuff, and we had no real real idea what the route was going to be like because this was this was before the internet where now you can go on the internet and you'll find like topos and you'll find photographs and you know people will have flown a drone around and seen where you know what the was it the traverse of the angels or the whatever it is the, the classic pitch on the on the route uh, but at the time there wasn't really any information at all so um so we went up to the matterhorn and uh <laughs> So we uh, got to the hut. It was this was kind of in the winter time. Uh, when we got to the hut, there was this uh, these two women there, and they were like, "Our boyfriends have left to climb the Matterhorn, and you haven't come back." And we're like, "Oh Christ, this is like this, this, this is not this is not a good start." And uh, eventually, they they kind of came back at like midnight, and they were all frozen and everything else. So they survived. And then anyway, so they went off, and then. Uh, the weather the weather wasn't very good, so we sort of sat there for a few days, and we, went, we walked down to Zermatt, and then we walked back up again. And then uh, the, the weather was like a little bit better, so we 
we we had a go, but um, same kind of thing. The weather was the weather was uh, crap. So we we, we climbed, but we you know maybe we climbed like one pitch or something. We just moving together, and it's like this isn't very good. So we we came back down, and it's interesting with Paul with Paul Ramsden. I, I did loads of, I did loads of trips with Paul Ramsden, and nearly all of them were a complete failure. And I think I don't know. I don't know why. I think sometimes if if both people are really really well matched, well, I'm not saying I'm well matched, but at the t- time we're probably quite well matched. That you kind of psych each other out. You want one person to feel slightly better than the other one. If you, if you, and if, if you know what I mean, it's quite a, it, interesting psychology. Um, like I always thought he was better than I was, and he always thought I was better than he was, which was not a good way to you know. I, but with Callum, I knew that Callum was a, a hell of a lot better than I was, so that's what we did. So we. So we went up to the Matterhorn and we uh, the hut was closed for renovations and the only room was this uh, little tiny kind of, I don't know what it was, it was like a, a toilet or something that was kind of open in the winter. So we we just like slept in there and the weather wasn't the weather wasn't great. Uh, uh, I think we found a packet of M&Ms, a big packet of M&Ms. And I think that Callum, like all of them, which was a bad start for the for our partnership and also he had one of these therma rests which was full of uh, crisp packets or something because every time you moved all night long it was like someone was laying on those of crisp packets and uh, so the eventually we decided to to head off and sitting there for such a long time um like little things like callum had like this therma rest and i was trying to imagine how he would sleep on the banati with his therma rest i thought he'd just like slide off down the mountain so i was like oh that's probably pro- i was like overthinking it and so we decided we would just try the north face route so we we headed off across the ice as i've done a few times before started started climbing up and it was like it was it just wasn't going to work it was too cold just there was the wrong vibe between me and callum or whatever um my life was in a total still in a complete mess at the time and uh so we were like let's just go back down so we, <laughs> So we have to back down. So um, so I think actually this talk, this I've actually been set up by, I've actually been set up here because I never actually climbed the northwest of the Matterhorn. Like I've literally climbed, um, you know, like hundred meters up the bottom of it, and that's it. So I think Victor Saunders is just, you know, he kind of tricked me into the slideshow. So I do apologise everybody for listening, and uh, this was this was his wild card, I think that you know. So um, yeah, well, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> not be packing heat, but Paul and Nick are hoping they're Fantastic, Andy. So, I mean, not only are you not a member of the, of the Alpine Club, but you haven't climbed the Matterhorn. I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> but a brilliant story. Really enjoyed that. So, thank you so much. Uh, Love it. So now we're off. I'm using everyone, so you can give everyone a team. Yeah. Um, yeah. So everyone's on mute. I grew up surrounded by. Thank you, Trevor. Okay. And now I'll meet you all again. Um, so uh, the trick now is if you could do um, any questions for all the um, the three uh, teams. Whilst you're pondering that, if you would, I'm just going to have a quick um, commercial break with upcoming uh, productions. So uh, again, I'll just share my screen there. And hopefully you're seeing there my screen. Um, so first up next week, um, we're back on our own program. So the Alpine Club are doing um, a uh, an Alpine um, story uh, with um, a pair of Nicks, Nick Simmons, Nick Smith and Rich Live all talking about uh, some Alpine capers. Um, from the Rucksack Club point of view, we're uh, also on a kind of a diverse mix. Um, got a bit of Alpine stuff with Jack Hurleywell, um, but we've also got some ski touring with Steve Smith uh, and we've got uh, Claire and Ian Wilson talking about uh, an, an Ecuadorian uh, expedition. Uh, so a, a whole um, fun jumble of stuff there. Um, now, I'd really encourage uh, the, the mass audience of Alpine Club and Rucksack Club, you take your pick. Um, it wouldn't offend me if Rucksack Club members had a, a, an inkling hankering after some of the Alpine Club stuff. Vice versa, Alpine Club members, welcome to come and join us in Ecuador if that uh, takes your fancy. Um, then we're back together again on the 7th of July, where we have the second um, trilogy of the uh, North Faces. 
Uh, so we'll be on the Drew with James Thacker, uh, the Fitzpadil with Ian Bryant, and I'll be bringing up the rear um, on Chima Grandi. Um, and that pretty much will wrap up the Rucksacks programme for the, the summer. Um, before I go to the questions, I just want to interject with a, another bit of a um, two minute commercial break, if I can. Not a commercial break, but um, uh, so just kind of uh, I've been pondering. Um, so 12 weeks ago, uh, we were started lockdown. We started these slideshows. I guess uh, in hindsight, what we're looking for was uh, we were missing the mountains, missing being able to get out and do the stuff we love and uh, enjoy climbing, walking, mountaineering, whatever. And we're missing the, the com camaraderie that comes with that um, from club members, friends, what have you. Um, then it got to strike me that actually, OK, we've got three months without climbing. So many people haven't discovered climbing yet uh, and are missing out on this amazing thing that we all share. And um, why don't we try and put a little bit back? So uh, this is a um, little plug for a charity uh, called uh, Urban Uprising. And what these guys do is um, use climbing to elevate and inspire. So they take people from all backgrounds, usually disadvantaged, introduce them to climbing as a way of helping them discover themselves, discover uh, others, um, and really build the confidence and, and maybe establish a love of climbing going forward. Um, so it's a bit cheeky. I'm sorry to hijack the event for just two minutes, but I'm going to share the link um, to a Just Giving page. Uh, and if you feel um, like you'd like to share that aspiration, um, then just please click and, uh, and donate. Um, I would say the other thing that uh, strikes me is that um, when I look at the, the Zoom screen of 150 people, um, most of us are old. Most of us are white, most of us are male. Um, and if we can do something for bringing diversity into the climbing world uh, through organizations like this, then I think that's to be praised as well. Um, so enough of the uh, advertising break, uh, I'll stop there. Um, I will copy the Zoom link to the chat, um, but then I will uh, get back to questions. So uh, if you would, um, questions folks. Uh, I've got um, many thanks for organising. Uh, yep, that's not a question, but thank you, Jess. Um, actually, Andy, I've got a question. Um, it was Neil Chelton you were on the Iger with, mate, not uh, uh, not Callum Musket. Uh, uh, your first oh, yeah. name check was uh, was uh, oh, wrong. Yeah. Neil. <laughs> oh, did I said Neil. Oh, yeah. So it was Neil. Yeah. Yeah, it was Neil. Yeah. He told me a very different Neil. story about the rope. He reckoned you bought a really big rope, chopped it in half to make two really quite big ropes, and they had to knot it together when you find out they weren't quite as big. So oh yeah, that was uh, that was another yeah that was another <laughs> rope incident. That was yeah <laughs> yeah we had a hundred we had a hundred meter static because right. when I tried when I tried to solo the Harlan, you could only get you seemed to get good belays every hundred meters. If you had a sixty meter rope, you were kind of screwed. So we had these. We had a 100 meter lead line and a 100 meter static, but when we pulled it out of the bag, it was two 50 meter static. So we had to, we had to pass the knot every time we hold the hold the bag. So yeah, that's a, well remembered. Yeah. yeah, that's a great story. I love that one. Uh, <laughs> other other questions from the uh, assembled audience. Um, so one cropped up during the discussion, which was from um, I think Martin to say. Do, um, do Bill and Seth always argue that much and do they still climb together? Um, uh, so, uh, Bill, Seth, would you like to comment on that? Uh, am I muted? No, you're unmuted, mate. Oh. Yes, you really are unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you get that? We got the drift. Yeah. Uh, where is he? Hiding. Where's Reg? I'm going to go. Did you, uh, did you know? I tell you what, the thing that got me about the north face of the Eiger was 1930. Well, 1935. There were two lads that got to death bidwack without doing all that interstitial stuff. And uh, unfortunately, they died there. I, I know that. It's a bad thing. That, but they avoided the interstitial. Uh, amazing. And 
Apart from that, um, I wish I could have found their line, actually. Don, Thank you, I, Bill. I, I, I've got a question for myself. Oh, go ahead, Martin. Well, it's actually my wow. friend Ollie, my friend Ollie, who's alluding to the fact that I am, well, actually I was, I am no longer a member of the Caravan Club. And he said he's looking forward to hearing how membership of the Caravan Club prepares me for such an arduous climb. And then another time I thought, yeah, he, he said to me, are you the only member of the Caravan Club? At that time I'd climbed the, uh, the you know, the Eiger, he said, to have climbed the north face of the Eiger. But I'm looking at another member of the Caravan Club, Mr. Bill Deakin, who's also climbed. So it got me thinking how, how much joint membership there is between the Caravan Club and our two august bodies here who have climbed these north faces. <laughs> and what is it about being in the Caravan Club means you can climb north faces? Bill, any thoughts? Has it got to this? <laughs> yeah. Actually, we're talking about membership of unique um, clubs. I think um, here's a trivia question for you. Uh, name two climbers who have um, done this uh, feat. So uh, North Essie Iger, climbed El Cap, um, done the Bob Graham and done the Berger. Oh, I can't think of any other person. <laughs> oh, well, that's one of them. And where is Mr. Wallace? Who is the other one? I've not been. I've not been down the Berger, but my brother. Oh, has. bugger! My brother, my brother has. Oh, uh, sorry, mate. That that counts. Counts. I, fl I flip in hate caving. It's terrifying. I'm counting that. That'll do. <laughs> it, might be, story, it, now. Might be, it might be. It might be Rhodes. It probably is. Oh, sorry, question from Rob McGuinness. Yeah. Uh, question on the Walker Spur. I'm a firm at the Italians. Oh, I'll, I'll try and unmute you, Rob, and you can ask yourself. Hang on a second. If I can find you. Uh, okay, you can ask yourself, Rob. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, um, there's uh, just a, on a slide or two on after the lads met the Italian guys. There was, um, I wasn't sure if it was a bit of fixed rope or an anchor or something in situ, but it looked like um, some <laughs> I couldn't work out what it was, but it's some red metal by the ropes and uh, in the crack. and. I, I wasn't quite sure what it was. I just wanted it didn't look like normal rock protection. So just wondering if it was a, a little is there fixed anchors on it anywhere or is it was it uh, just yeah. something I'm imagining seeing? Yeah, I can't, I can't I can't remember the you know, I can't remember the details, but like like any of these faces, well, well, there's bits of old fixed gear all over the place. You know, yeah. old pegs, tap, bongs, you know, all sorts. So um you know, it would just be another bit of that, and they, 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 you know, there's there's bits like this strewn absolutely everywhere, and you can't, you know, you can't trust it, and you can't um, can't you, follow it. You can't you can't follow it either because there's plenty of it, you know, where you don't want to be going. Right, yeah, it's not a helpful uh, sign of the right route then. <laughs> yeah, no, no it's definitely not. Route. Definitely in a few places, it take you off route. Um, yeah, so it's probably in a lot of cases it's best avoided. Um, you know. Um, right. Not, I mean, there's there's not many that it's bits of tap, but there's probably not not many things that you'd really want to trust. I don't think uh, were there, Nick. Really? No, no. In fact, you know, same on the Iger as well. I think you know, Bill and Sess might have a comment, yeah. but yeah, every everywhere on the Iger, you could imagine you could put a peg. Um, mm. That there's already a peg. You know, you'd, you'd struggle yeah. to place a new peg. You know, almost anywhere. Yeah, and they and they were pretty shit, weren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of fixed kit on these routes, and a lot of it's really old and really, you know, of an unknown vintage. A question for Nigel. Yes. Anything coming on the uh, YouTube uh, chat, Nigel? Uh, no, not yet. Um, just uh, a couple of questions, <laughs> uh, a couple of statements, really. I'm loving the heckling, and uh, people enjoyed it. Um, so, uh, yeah, Bill, no Bill and Seth are available for Panto season. It's uh, They're booking <laughs> now. Um, just... Uh, I wish I wish we could do otherwise. It's not, it's not an act. <laughs> Where is he? I've lost him. Where is he? Any more questions from anybody out there in uh, in Zoom land? Going once? Maybe not. Oh, we've got a hand raised. Hi, Paul. Uh, I'll just unmute you. No. Oh. Hmm. Hang on a sec, Paul. I just got to get you unmuted. No. 
Hello. How about that then? Go for it, Paul. Um, yeah. You're on. This is just a, just a personal one for Tony Rhodes. Are you, in fact, related to the late lamented George well, Rhodes? A new long ago. ago. Are you interested to ask Is this the gold version? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't hear music. I, can't, I couldn't hear the question then. Try again, Paul. No, we've lost him. Paul, sorry, Paul. You had to unmute yourself, mate. That's it. Yep. For yes, for the second or third time, <laughs> trying again. A personal one for Tony Rhodes. Are you by any chance related to the late lamented George Rhodes, whom I knew long, long ago? Ah, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not Paul. I met George and I'm, I've cycled with his son a, a few years ago uh, because I live quite close to the, the out of a garage up uh, near Stoke. Yes, so they did. I did meet George? No, I don't, I, I'm not related. No, no. OK, well, uh, I put an anecdote about George in the book about the Penagurid Hotel, Tales from the Smoke Room, a few years ago. Uh -huh. And I was amazed to actually track him down and delighted to find he was still alive at that point, although he has sadly passed on yes. then. But, uh, is his friends reunited as well? <laughs> <laughs> we do dating as well, Bill. Hey, uh, stop oh. it right there. Stop it right there. <laughs> OK, well, uh, any more for any more questions? Uh, otherwise, I'll let you get on for the rest of the evening. Uh, hi, got... it's Ellie. Has Ellie got a question? Hello, Ellie. Have you got a question, Ali? I'm afraid no, we don't have any questions. Oh, she was raving. <laughs> I've got. I've got okay, in which case, caravan, I'll let you, let you get on with the rest of the evening. Thank go you so on. much for coming. Oh, no, and uh, oh, Mike's got one. Here we go. No, I'd like to say about Caravan Club. I, I did, I did the about the uh, barn last week. Go ahead, mate. Hey, well, um, Andy, what's the route that you've um, not done that you'd most like to go back to and finish? Andy. Andy, is he, he's on mute right now, so he's got to be unmuted. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're good, yeah. Um, pro probably the Harlan, I think. Just because okay. it's, um, it's got so much interesting sort of history and. Uh, you know, it's kind of such a classic kind of story, isn't it? Really, the Harlan on the Eiger. Awesome. So the one. Tom, I've got a quick question. Go for it, John. Hey, it, uh, quick question for Andy. Um, Andy, what are those pictures of boats behind you? <laughs> uh, I'm in. A, I'm in someone's house. Is actually a sailor, so it's the, the oh. house is full of pictures of boats. So, all right. Uh, is it, this is in, this is in Dublin. Okay. Hey, listen, thanks for showing up to this auspicious evening. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's my, my pleasure. Hi, okay, okay, I'd just like you to leave, can um, you do copy and paste the link I've just shared on the, uh, on the group chat for the uh, Urban Uprising and uh, show your appreciation for the fun and games we've had uh, together over the last uh, 12 weeks. Um, any more for any more? Any questions? I'd just like to add about the Caravan Club. Oh, go, mate. <laughs> Dave Barton's a member of the Caravan Club, and he's done all the six, five of the four of the North Faces. Uh, there is something in it, then. Yeah, and he's yeah. turned up the matter on, but he got chased off by the police. So, the oh, the Caravan back. Police? Dermat. <laughs> not, not chased off by the Caravan Police? <laughs> no, no, not the Caravan Club. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> nice one, Dom. Thank you. Thanks thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. And thank you, uh, thanks for a marvelous thank evening. You. Thanks, Dom. Thanks. Well done. Yeah, everyone. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thank you Good very much, everybody. Dom. Good night, Good night, Reg. Hey, yes, thank you. <laughs> Good night, Reg. 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 Good night,